Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Pellet Hormone Therapy, a primer for clinicians, hosted by Power to Practice with Dr. Ken C. Kine of Soto Palais. If you don't already know about Power to Practice, you're missing out. It's the only platform specifically designed for how integrative medicine practitioners work. It not only includes an EMR, but also features an intuitive patient portal and practice management tools with all of the integrative specific features that traditional EMRs don't have, such as custom compounding, one-click custom lab ordering, and IV therapies. Power to Practice is proud to serve over 1,000 plus providers and 3,000 plus patients who choose integrative care. For more information and to find out how Power to Practice can help save you time, money, and streamline your administrative tasks, please visit us at powertopractice.com. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Ken Seekine, is a board-certified OBGYN who has been in private practice since 1981. He has transitioned over the years with his patients from pre-pregnancy care through their childbearing years and into life-changing menopausal years. Always believing that the changes and symptoms associated with menopause were pathologic and not simply <laughs> physiologic, he embraced the study of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy where the results achieved by his patients have been exceedingly well received. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Sikine. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, sunny Florida, where it's uh, 70 degrees and uh, low humidity for about the next two weeks, and then we go into the, the sauna bath for the rest of the summer. Um, I'm really excited to uh, to make this presentation tonight because, as Britt said, I've been uh, transitioning over the years uh, to take care of my patients, and as many of you have experienced, you've grown with them uh, through the times of the changes in their lives, uh, from childbearing to to their uh, menopausal years, and. Um, it can get very frustrating when you are presented with problems that the uh, traditional, conventional medications, approaches that we have been taught in our residencies just don't cut it and don't get to the bottom of what their problems are. So um, basic question, what is HRT? So we know that about 3,500 women enter menopause every day. Um, their symptoms may begin 15 years earlier, um, and a lot of women just say, well, you know, maybe I'm going through the changes. Uh, we see women in atypical ages that come in and think they're menopausal, um, <clears throat> and by the symptoms they sound like they may be menopausal, but uh, we take a few steps to find out whether they really are or they're not. Uh, hypogonadism occurs in about 20% of males over the age of 50, and what I found is that I'm seeing men in their mid to late 40s whose testosterone levels are uh, low enough for them to need replacement. Next slide. So. What are the symptoms that we hear from the patients? Um, fatigues, mood swings, hot flashes, night sweats, weight gain, sleeping problems, memory loss, decreased sex drive, um, depression, loss of, uh, of their ability to function sexually, joint pain. Um, these can be both male and females, and uh, so many of these symptoms are symptoms that in the past I was confronted with and had really no answer to them. There were a lot of, well, it's life and, you know, maybe you have arthritis and, and so on and so forth. But um, once we uncovered what the real problem was, it became very easy to help the patients and take care of it. Next slide. So some of the questions that we can use to help identify HRT candidates, you know, are you feeling healthy? Uh, how often do you feel tired? Is life fun for you? Uh, is pain a constant thing? Do you dread 
having sex, how's your sleeping, um, do you enjoy life or you just survive it, are you waking up tired, next slide. So when we talk about HRT for women, uh, there is no magic hormone or combination of hormones that can be indiscriminately used by all women. One shoe absolutely doesn't fit all. And as we've all experienced, uh, you start with the green pill and you go to the yellow pill and you go to the purple pill and, or whatever, whatever order those permanent pills are in. Um, you just keep changing it and hoping that when they come back, they say, yep, that was the right one. But each woman is an individual, and our hormone balance must be the ultimate goal for all women. Next slide. So when we talk about an estradiol to estrone ratio, um, the ideal ratio is a two-to-one ratio of estradiol to estrone. Uh, when I do my lectures, we go through that all famous cholesterol breakdown of hormones and how we end up with estradiol, estriol, estrone, uh, the dreaded biochemistry change. Um, <clears throat> but in menopause, we see the changes, the ratio reversed. So we have more estrone than estradiol. When we try to replace it, the synthetic hormones will give a 1 to 10 ratio of estradiol to estrone. Uh, the bioidentical sublinguals have a 1 to 2, the gels 1 to 2, the transdermal patch 1 to 5, and the pellet therapy is a 2 to 1, which absolutely mimics what the body was having before the menopause. Next. <clears throat> so <clears throat> progesterone um, is a hormone that the ovaries produce predominantly after ovulation, as we know, and it has many functions. In the case of hormonal replacement therapy, we use it um, in women who have a uterus. It's absolutely malpractice to use an estrogen replacement without having some type of progesterone or progestin uh, anti-estrogen effect on the lining of the uterus or the endometrium. It's also found to be an anti-anxiety, relaxation, and it helps sleep, so we usually recommend taking uh, the progesterone before they go to bed. There are some compounding pharmacies that are making progesterone pellets, but we have not found them to be reliable. Uh, so we do use the micronized progesterone, uh, start off with 100 milligrams, and uh, they take it before bedtime. The micronized progesterone, as you know, is very safe. We use it in pregnancy for uh, women who've had multiple miscarriages, so it is as close to a bioidentical pro uh, progesterone that we have. Next slide. Go back one. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Get me to the testosterone slide. There we go. Okay. So what about testosterone? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned when I first started talking that and going over those symptoms, um, I would have patients come in, as I'm sure many of you do, um, you fix their hot flashes, you fix their night sweats, uh, their vaginal dryness, but yet they come in and they say, I'm tired, I can't think straight, everybody's calling me nasty, um, I just fly off of the handle, um, I have no sex drive. So the response would be, well, you know, you got three kids, you, you work all day, you come home, you got to take care of the kids, make dinner, and then your husband wants to have sex and you're just fatigued. So that was our excuse. Well, when I found out about testosterone levels in females, it changed the whole picture. So we know that memory depends on it. Neurotransmitters in the brain uh, are increased through testosterone and estradiol, estradiol treatment, treatment, and the memory responds quickly. It's absolutely remarkable, um, the response that you see from patients. There have been studies that are going on for dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and even traumatic brain injury with using testosterone for a healing process or a minimizing the progression process. 
Next slide. So there have been some studies to show in Alzheimer's disease, uh, women get it 8 to 1 over men. Uh, women on estrogen are 50% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And men with low testosterone are three, to three times more likely to develop the disease. Next slide. Fibromyalgia, you know, this is kind of a, a, a mixed bag of, of um, we don't know what to do about it. Uh, there's a lot of different pain medication treatments and, and uh, biofeedback and, and all different kinds of, uh, of um, approaches. But <clears throat> it is difficult to diagnose. Uh, it's been treated with antidepressants. You know, we see multiple areas of tender spots and um, just everything um, tends to, when you try to work it up, you, you don't get any definitive uh, uh, laboratory tests back, but uh, we have found that it is associated with low free testosterone levels. Next. <clears throat> so HRT for men, uh, i.e. testosterone replacement, um, very positive effects of natural testosterone, and when we hear the advertisements about how dangerous uh, testosterone is, and if you've had a heart attack or you've had a stroke and you've been on testosterone injections, they're two different beasts. Uh, we're talking about synthetic um, uh, testosterone versus the bioidentical natural testosterone. So we see it enhances erectile ability, um, prostate protection, enhances libido, increases energy, uh, there's increased muscle, muscle strength. I see a lot of men who come in that have been working out and are very frustrated because they don't see the definition of their muscles anymore. But after they get their testosterone, they come back and they're happy about the strength increase and their definition is coming back. Cognitive clarity. Um, as I mentioned, we use it in, in, uh, in um, Parkinson's patients and, um, and also in traumatic brain injury patients. Next slide. So what are the different methods that we all have been um, exposed to? Certainly the patches, the pills, injectables. In the bioidentical, uh, the, the pills, patches, trochies, uh, creams, gels, and the pellets. Next slide. <clears throat> so what's so amazing about the pellets? What's so different about the pellets? Well, they are natural, they're plant and soy der derived. Um, they have the same molecular structure as the human body was producing. <clears throat> they last longer than other treatments. In the females, we see three to four months. I had a woman that came in today that was eight months since her last treatment, although she did admit that she probably should have been in maybe a month or two earlier. But it's even six months for a female is, is a, a, a long period of time. And the males we're seeing a minimum of six months. Some of them I see coming back eight to ten months. And it does provide a steady stream of hormones in the blood 24-7. Uh, and <clears throat> the key, the absolute key, and if I was able to underline it, this is individualized dosing. And I'll explain that a little bit as we move along. But... <clears throat> When I explain this to patients, I tell them it's like artificial ovaries or artificial testes. Because when our ovaries and our testes were functioning normally, the body demanded the hormones and it gave it to them. And that's what the pellets do. Uh, they're sitting in subcute tissue with a lot of capillaries around them, and they slowly dissolve. So the more activity, the more energy that somebody's exerting, the temperature of the area increases where the pellets are, and they're going to deliver more hormones. Um, so, just to jump ahead, when we're calculating how much each person will get, we have a, a slot in there that asks what their activity level is. So someone who's sedentary and only works is going to get less of a dose than someone who is act actively working out five times a week. Next slide. So um, what are the pellets? Well, I have patients say, 
how come nobody knows about them? Are they brand new? Where you know what, what's the story on them? Well, they actually have been around since 1939, and um, they started in Europe. Uh, they're either pure estradiol or testosterone. Uh, the delivery system is safe and effective. Uh, the only form of delivery that closely mirrors what the human ovary and testicle do does. And it's a delivery method that dictates the bioavailability, absorbability, and amount of consistency of release. Next. So a little history on the pellets. As I said, they were developed in 1939 for uh, women who had radical hysterectomies. Um, they discussed the use of estradiol and testosterone pellets for the symptoms of menopause. Dr. Greenblatt uh, was a reproductive endocrinologist at the Ameri uh, yeah, Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia. And, and um, <clears throat> actually, when I was a resident here in Florida, we had a lot of of the medical students rotating from uh, MCG with us and they would talk about these pellets because Dr. Greenblatt was training his medical students and residents on on the treatment. The problem at the time was and up until I think Dr. Tutera who started Cenopelli um, about 25-30 years ago uh, the problem was the quality of pellets and the number of compounding pharmacies were few and far between. Um, but these have been widely used in Europe and Asia and Australia since, 19, since the 1930s. Next slide. So again, some of the benefits, um, it keeps that estradiol, estradiol to estrone ratio of 2 to 1. They are biologically identical. They're constantly available to the body. They're absorbed directly and they're not taken orally, which avoids the first pass of the liver, which is absolutely important as far as blood clotting factors and enzymes that can be a problem if the liver is churning out these, these, uh, these substances. There's a, study, a steady state of hormones. You don't have that roller coaster effect where you're taking a daily dose, either orally or creams, uh, minimal weight gain, if any, they're extremely safe and they're absolutely hassle-free because once you put them in, they forget about it being there. Next slide. Now, do they really work? So, I'd have to answer that question. Um, when I found out about Soda Pelli, I still had in the back of my mind what I had heard years before during my residency um, about the pellets. And there was nowhere, nowhere to be found. Uh, when I happened to see a small blurb in, in one of the throwaway journals, I called up Dr. Tutera and I said, I'm from Florida and I'd really like to come out and learn about this. Um, went out there, trained with him, and uh, actually went to his clinic. There were probably 10 of us. Went to his clinic, had some practical experience uh, inserting the pellets. My, my more concern was to talk to the patients and find out how they feel. And I, I realized he couldn't be paying all of them to say what they were saying. So um, the, when I came back and I started doing them, I still had a reluctance to think this is too good to be true. It can't work uh, for, for most of the people. Um, and what I found over these eight years that I'm doing it is that it is absolutely incredible. Um, and these symptoms that you see here are no question are um, reduced um, or increased. The lack of sexual increase um, over 24 weeks the, uh, has, gone, has gone down. The vasomotor discomfort, the somatic symptoms, depression, anxiety. I mean, it, it's almost like patients are talking to each other before they come in and they say, this is what we're going to tell Dr. Seekine about how we feel. Because patient after patient, without even talking in the waiting room, is coming in and they're saying the same things. So um, it absolutely works. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, the pellet, pellet patients report. You know, increased levels of energy, restored interest in life. 
I've had more than one woman come in and say, you saved my, my, my marriage. And these are not women in their 50s. These are women uh, as young as 39 and 40 who um, are just getting testosterone replacement because their main concerns are their energy and more so their sex drive. Uh, and it's very easy to write off, you've got three kids, you know, you don't have time for sex. But when you actually look at their testosterone levels, um, there's room for improvement. And trust me, they are improved. Their mood consistency, uh, relief from anxiety and depression, I have patients that absolutely go off their SSRIs. I, I see so many women who come in and their GPs and even their gynecologists are putting them on SSRIs for the symptoms that we just went over. Um, I think there's this, this myth, this fear um, of using hormones. And um, I, I can tell you that there's enough, enough studies that, out there for um, evidence-based medicine to show that, that there are absolute benefits. And I think ACOG is even starting to come around now to talk about the benefits of estrogen and perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. We see decreased body fat and greater capacity for getting the body in shape. Next slide. So Susan Davis in Menopause, um, uh, Journal Menopause, her conclusion was estrogen replacement with pellets has effects on body fat and postmenopausal women that are associated with improved lipid parameters, decreases the total cholesterol and LDL, increases the HDL, decreases the triglycerides. The addition of testosterone does not negate the favorable effects of estrogen, and there is a reduction in the fat mass seen in both males and females. Um, <clears throat> we find that men who have metabolic syndrome, um, who become type 2 diabetics, have very low testosterone levels. And it's been shown that when we replace their testosterone and get them up to normal levels, that their insulin requirements or their, their, uh, their type 2 diabetes medications either become minimal or they can stop them altogether. Next slide. So, um, as I said earlier, conventional HRT, the Women's Health Initiative created a fury in this country. Um, for those of you that have, were around when this came out, um, you know, they reported 41% increase in stroke, 29% increase in heart attacks, increase in breast cancer, twice the rate of blood clots. Um, the, the, the study has been refuted numerous times. but it put a fear of God in everybody about hormonal replacement. But in, in follow-up to that, my patients who said, take me off the hormones, it wasn't but three or four months later, if that long, they came back and said, I'll die of a stroke, I'll die of a heart attack, I'll die of blood clots, but I'm going to kill myself if I don't get back on the hormones. So, um, you know, this scared everybody. Next slide. So what kind of patient would benefit most from pellet therapy? So anybody suffering from perimenopausal symptoms, certainly menopause, andropause, osteoporosis. I have, we have a, um, do our own bone densities in the office. We have a DEXA machine, and I have patients who are really not complaining of menopausal symptoms. And as you know, to try and convince someone, especially with hormones, to go on hormones when they're not having symptoms, uh, they're not going to buy it. <clears throat> But I do have patients who have severe osteopenia, osteoporosis, and I give them all the choices, but I tell them the absolute most natural, probably the best effective way to stop bone loss and to increase laying down new bone is with estrogen replacement therapy. And then I tell them about the pellets. And I've had numerous women who have gone on it purely for the bone loss, and within two years, they have increased, they not, not only have stopped losing bone, but they absolutely have cr increased their bone densities. Uh, certainly people with decreased libido, depression, and as I mentioned earlier, any of the brain problems, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Next slide, please. So what's the downside? <clears throat> So <clears throat> we insert them under the skin. It's really no big deal. Um, the trocar is probably the size of a maybe a 14 gauge or a, or a 12 gauge um, 
needle. Uh, it's a hollow tube so that we can put the put the pellets in and, and plunge them, or use a, 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 a um, stylet to push them into the sub-Q tissue. But um, usually we use the buttock. I remember when I was a resident and I learned about these, they were putting them in the abdominal fat. And it just seemed so barbaric to be sticking this trocar in the abdominal fat. I've had two patients that have requested that because that, that's the way they've had it over the years. But the overwhelming majority, we put it in the, in the buttock tissue. Um, it can expose uterine fibroids, uh, endometrial polyps. Uh, I've had I've had a handful of endometrial um, cancers, certainly not caused by the hormones, but when you stimulate that tissue, uh, you know, as a gynecologist, I'm not just putting the pellets in and telling the patients go away and don't call me. Um, so when they call with something that is out of the ordinary or is bothering them, and probably the number one phone call that we get is about uh, bleeding. Um, you have what I explain to the patient. We wake up the endometrium with, with estradiol, not on everybody, but um, certainly a significant number that will call and say, I'm bleeding. So we explain to them that this is due to the estrogen. Whether or not it's pellets, it still would be the problem from any type of hormones they're on. Um, I explain to them the progesterone they're taking is what is an anti-estrogen and is going to protect the lining from turning to precancer or cancer cells. Uh, if we can't get the bleeding stopped by increasing the dose of progesterone or, or pulsing the dose of progesterone or cycling the dose of progesterone, um, then we proceed with ultrasound, um, a uh, hysteroscopy, and mutual biopsy, and you know we find polyps. Uh, like I said, I found <clears throat> over the years uh, a couple of endometrial cancers that were picked up very early and treated and cured. So um, you know it, it's 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 a positive for some underlying pathology that may not show itself until it's too late. Not all the pellets are the same and can cause problems in, in experienced hands. Next slide. So how are the pellets inserted? I just I explained that. We um, just clean the, the buttock skin off with some uh, betadine or uh, any type of soapy uh, um, fluid. Um, inject some local anesthetic where we mix the 1% um, <clears throat> lidocaine with some bicarb to minimize any of the burning. Uh, inject a wheel and then make a track with it. Uh, take a... a, a um, scalpel make just a puncture so that the trocar will fit right nicely under the skin. Uh, put the pellets into the trocar, insert the pellets, pull it out, and um, I use a tagaderm, which is um, what they use for IVs. It's just a clear plastic waterproof band-aid, and they leave that on for three days, and um, they do fine. They do great with it. Are there any side effects or complications from the insertion? In men, because we use so many more pellets, um, there's a less than a 1% chance uh, of exclusion of, of the pellets. I don't, haven't seen it very often. I have seen my share of it, but uh, if it's a significant, significant number, we just add some back in and, and they do fine. Next slide. So <clears throat> what are the costs of the pellet therapy? Um, so they often replace two to three time, two to three other medications with their co-pays per month. Uh, they replace any herbs and supplements and all kinds of, you know, instead of treating piecemeal, this is going to cover everything, the, this, all the symptoms together. Uh, they're dosed every four to six months versus, versus monthly, and uh, they can repla replace two to three of the co-pays times four to six months. So basically, males are $600, including, uh, that's with the medication and the insertion, and the females are $300. And that's pretty much standard around the country. Um, you can go to cities like Miami, and, and there's absolute ridiculous prices. There are some clinics around, uh, and that's all they do is they have a, a pellet mill, and we have one here in Jacksonville where they're charging $3,600 a year for total inclusive, including lab work. 
Um, <clears throat> well, if you're only doing it four times a year, let's say, that's $1,200. I f the labs are covered by most insurances, so the patients are not paying for that. So there are, there are these commercial type clinics that are trying to capitalize on uh, our patients' um, misery. Next slide. So how are they monitored? Well, we do lab work. Uh, and this is what's unique about this. There's no guesswork. Um, when a patient comes in and gives me the list of symptoms, I say, sure sounds like you are hormonally deficient, but the proof is going to be in the objective findings. So we send them for lab work. Um, we order uh, FSH and uh, estradiol, total and free, testosterone. We do an SHGB, uh, um, uh, sex hormone binding globulin. Um, we do thyroid studies because of the potential overlap of symptoms there. And based on those numbers, there is a proprietary formula that Dr. Tutera formulated himself. <clears throat> and it takes into account the age, um, the height, the weight, and the labs, the pre-pellet lab values of each patient, and will give us a suggested dose customized for that specific patient. Now, is every patient going to have a totally different? No, there. Are, I mean, many patients are getting the same type of dose, but um, after eight years, I still can't guess correctly when I look at a patient what their dose needs to be. I try to do that, and then I plug it into the formula, and I'm off some. <clears throat> so how do we know it's the right dose? Four to six weeks later, um, we do repeat labs, post labs. Patients come in after they get the labs done and we do a before and after comparison and see how they're feeling. And um, as Dr. Tutera told me, and I'll, I'll tell those of you who are doing obstetrics still, the hugs and the kisses and the thank yous that you get or got from the patients you delivered their babies, he said, once you start treating patients with pellets, they're going to hug you and thank you and tell you how you changed their lives. And it happens every day. I go out to dinner with my wife and I run into a patient who's a pellet patient and they walk up to the table and look at my wife and say, I love this man. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what's the future of pellet therapy? Uh, new generation using cutting edge techniques, requesting natural versus synthetic options. We see patients coming in all the time and I'm sure you hear, you know, don't, I want bioidentical, I want something that's, that's uh, not going to have many side effects, and it's natural. Um, <clears throat> we think more and more people will want natural bioidentical hormones uh, delivered in a manner in which they don't have to hassle with it. Uh, Dr. Tutera had developed a new trocar, uh, which makes the insertion kind of painless and free from bruising. Um, it, it depends on, and I tell patients how delicate they are, uh, some get quite black and blue afterwards. Uh, they can get a, some ecchymosis under the skin and obviously from breaking some of the capillaries. But for the most part, they do fine. We tell them to put an ice pack on it for an hour or two afterwards. And um, the, the benefits far outweigh any pain in the butt that they get from inserting the, the, uh, the pellets. Next slide. So I looked at my watch and we're like 43 minutes into this lecture and I was wondering, thinking, how many more slides do I have? And there we go. So um, <clears throat> we, um, what I do on a monthly, well, I was doing it on a monthly basis, but we've spread it out to four times a year now is we do training and this is through Soda Pelly. I'm a, a Soda Pelly training physician. Um, we were, they were having everybody come out to Phoenix and for those of us on the East Coast it became a little cumbersome and they weren't capturing a whole lot of people. So um, Dr. Tutera and, and um, Carol Ann Tutera, his, his wife who actually runs the company, asked if I would be interested in being a, a trainer. 
So I do training in Jacksonville. Uh, I've had patients come from Buffalo, New York, and um, on the other side of Florida. And so anywhere that's kind of easier to get here than out to Phoenix. There's a Dr. Marable, who is now our medical director, and he's in Kansas City, so he covers the Midwest. <clears throat> and then there's um, a doctor out in Phoenix who works at the headquarters doing training out there. Uh, and there'll be more information, I think, that you'll get from um, Power to Practice when they send you the slides. But there's a, there's a whole lot more to emphasize about this. I, I just wanted to kind of get wet your whistle with, how excited I am with this and the reason I'm so excited is because every day the positive feedback that I get um, just reinforces more and more how this is something that needs to be embraced um, and you're still going to find the naysayers number one about hormones and number two that bioidentical and pellets just don't come up to what the other hormones are that the pharmaceutical companies are making. And I think there's some politics involved in why insurance companies don't cover it. Um, I, I think pharma has a, has a, a, a big um, uh, influence in that um, because they were making Testapel, which were testosterone pellets for men. I'm not sure they still do it. And, um, but they didn't cover any pellets for women. Um, so, if there are questions I can answer, I'd be more than happy to take them. So I don't see any uh, any questions right now, um, but if anyone does have questions after this presentation, um, you can certainly give us a call or you can um, email us at powertopractice.com. We'd be happy to forward any of those questions. Oh, wait a minute. We do have some. Um, let's see. Let's start with uh, with Laura Mendez. She said she's done BHRT for almost 25 years. She's seeing a patient on pellets and their hormone levels. Um, their hormone levels of uh, estradiol and testosterone. Um, many are, um, I guess, experiencing hair loss. Is there anything you can speak to about that? Well, I, I think. Um if, if you're monitoring their levels, then, um, you know, you can, if, it, if we're considering that it's from the testosterone levels, that they're sensitive to testosterone, then you can cut back on the testosterone. You can use uh, spironolactone to, uh, to, to, to block it at the skin level. Um, I have not seen a whole lot of hair loss. The other thing is women who are aging, um, are naturally going through some hair loss too. And, um, you know, they get concerned and will blame the hormones and they go to the dermatologist or they talk to their, um, to their hairdresser. And, um, you know, it, there's really no good, good answer to that. I mean, I've seen patients who have stopped the pellets because they felt their hair was thinning or, or they were losing it and um, it really didn't change things. Okay, great. Um, and then Kim wanted to know, what is the best way to test patients on pellet therapy, saliva, urine, or blood? Well, for pellets, it's absolutely blood. Uh, you can't get a FSH level other than uh, with blood. And I've seen patients who've had an estradiol level of 50 or 60 having symptoms. We did an FSH on them and it was 75 or above. And FSH is kind of like the um, hemoglobin A1C for diabetes. It kind of gives us an overall picture of what their uh, estrogen milieu is in their, in their body as opposed to moment to moment. Okay, great. Um, and then Pamela wanted to know, what if someone has an adverse reaction to the pellet? Have you ever removed a pellet? That's a great question, and I can tell you in the eight years and literally thousands of patients that I have put pellets in, I've never once had to remove them. I've had patients who asked to have them taken out. First of all, they're so small, and they're quite fragile. So for those of you who know about Nexplanon or Implanon, uh, those 
are silastic tubes and they're difficult to get out. So trying to get a little powdered uh, pellet out of the subcute tissue um, is, is impossible. What I do encourage them to understand is that within three to four months, it's going to be gone. And um, you see that because patients are knocking at my door every three, four, five months for a refill because their symptoms are coming back. So, no, I've never really had to, um, I've never had an adverse reaction that said I had to remove the pellets. Okay, great. And then Ron wanted to know, what levels of estradiol can you expect at one month, two months, three months post-insertion of a standard pellet? Are they physiologic? Um, well, we only test three weeks after the insertion of the pellet. Um, the fact that it, it lasts for three to four months, you know, I think everybody is different because they're going to absorb it at a different rate depending on their activity level, depending on their metabolic level. Um, so I can only tell you that at three weeks after the insertion, that's the peak point of where the hormone levels are going to be. And they certainly are um, at, at normal or the upper limit of normal. Uh, and no, they're not going to get any higher, but they'll gradually start coming down from there. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Alex wanted to know, are test pellets safe in men diagnosed with BPH? Absolutely. Um, there's a book that Dr. Morgenthaler, um, who's a urologist, wrote all about testosterone and prostate, prostate problems. Um, <clears throat> He basically says it's not only safe in BPH, but it's safe in um, PIN, prostate intraepithelial and neoplasia, um, as opposed to you know outright prostate cancer. So he has treated men with uh, with testosterone pellets who have PIN, but certainly with BPH it's okay. Um, we do follow uh, the men's PSAs. Uh, and it depends on how symptomatic their BPH is because you may increase uh, the volume of their, of their prostate with the testosterone. So you might, in the initial dose, you know, might want to cut back on what the recommended dose was somewhat and see how they do. Okay, great. Um, and then Debbie wanted to know, would you recommend pellets for patients who are chemically sensitive? Well, <clears throat> chemically sensitive, um, and, and if they give you a history of being chemically sensitive, then what I do is when I get the suggested dose from the formula that we use, I will back down on that dose because I do see patients who, for instance, if the formula recommends uh, 125 milligrams of testosterone, I feel a little bit more comfortable going, because of my experience now, I feel more comfortable going with someone maybe at 100 or 87 and a half uh, milligrams. Three weeks later, I will see where their levels are. Now, I've had patients who, if I recommended uh, 125 and I give them 87 and they come back, now the dose, the therapeutic level for testosterone um, in females is somewhere between 150 and 200. There's never been an established lab value, and they'll admit it, for, for testosterone levels in females. So you're going to see all the time Quest, LabCorp, any of those labs are going to return a 25, 30, 35 testosterone, total testosterone in a female and say it's normal. Well, it's not normal. And the primary care doctors are going to tell them it's normal. And they feel lousy. You get their testosterone up to 150 to 200, um, they're, going to, they're going to get the benefits, they're going to get the relief, and they're going to have minimal to no side effects. Um, and I say that from, from experience. So if you have a sensitive patient and you know it and they told you, I, you know, I, I can't take full doses, then it would behoove you to cut back on the suggested dose. Okay, wonderful. Um, I have a question from Ingborg. Um, pellets sound great, but some say women need to cycle. How can you cycle with pellets? 
Well, first of all, the majority of women we're dealing with um, are menopausal. Um, so women, if you're referring to psych, women cycling, uh, I would assume you mean the ones with a uterus and cycling a bleed off or whatever. Um, I think that's a, a myth. A myth. Um, if we don't, if we can take women who are of childbearing years on birth control pills and keep them on continuous hormone therapy so they don't have a period, there's no reason to take a menopausal or a perimenopausal woman and make her cycle. If you're giving her progesterone every day and the progesterone is working to make her amenorrheic, then it's the best of all worlds. She feels good, she's not bleeding, and you've got to protect it. Okay, great. Um, Marion wanted to know, do you monitor estrogen levels at all? I find some people are converters that have high estrogen, uh, estrone, but with men, do you monitor DHT? We don't I don't monitor DHT with men, but what we do monitor is estradiol levels in men uh, because there's aromatization of the testosterone. And some men will aromatize the testosterone more than others, and they start getting elevated um, estrogen levels, and they can have some, some side effects of estrogen. So um, either we cut them back on the dose. If they refuse to have the dose cut back because otherwise they're feeling great, and we add a little bit of an estrozole once or twice a week um, to kind of cut back on the uh, aromatization of the testosterone. Okay, great. And then CM wanted to know, would you recommend pellets for a patient who um, has had cancer? Um, it depends on what cancer. Uh, certainly any hormones in post breast cancer um, is, there's a big red flag and it's a no-no. Um, I think, you know, doing hormone pellets, you've already have one foot out of the box, um, if you'll agree with that. Um, I, I think, I've, I've had patients who've had breast cancer, they are 10 to 15 years out, they are miserable, um, they actually have consulted with their oncologists who said, you know, it's up to you, but since you're so far out from the breast cancer, you know, and your life is miserable, I, I give you my blessing. So I have some women who are breast cancer survivors, but many, many years since they've had it, who are on the pellets and have been doing great. Um, as far as any other cancers are concerned, colon cancer, uh, bladder cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, I don't think there's any contraindication to using hormones um, in, uh, in those, unless it's an ovarian cancer that might be estrogen sensitive, but I, I think we're talking about rarities there. Um, <clears throat> as far as males, uh, again with the prostate, uh, using large doses of testosterone in someone who has had prostate cancer, although if they've had a radical prostatectomy or they've had the seeds or they've had the proton beam, and totally destroyed the prostate, um, again, over a period of time from when their treatment was and, and they're cured, basically, um, it, it probably would not be unacceptable to use some testosterone. Okay, wonderful. Um, and then another question from Alvaro, how can I change a pellet from cream to pellets? Okay, that's a great question. Because I get patients all the time coming in um, <clears throat> on another form of HRT and they want to go to pellets. So in the formula, there is a, uh, an area where you can actually put in what uh, other horm non-pellet hormonal therapy they're on. So the, so the formula actually understands that the level of their hormones that you're putting into the formula at that time is um, secondary to them already being on hormones. So they may come in and have a normal FSH and have not a, a therapeutic level of estrogen, but when you put that FSH in there and it looks normal and then you tell the formula that they're on a milligram of estrase PO or they're on a patch or they're on creams, um, it's going to calculate as if they weren't on any hormones. 
So how do you transition them? Well, <clears throat> you don't want them to crash. The, um, the hot flashes and night sweats usually go away. Those are the symptoms that go away first. So at probably 24 to 48 hours, they're sleeping better, their hot flashes are markedly diminished, their night sweats are pretty much gone. So I just tell them to overlap what they've been using for the next three or four days. If they're using a patch and they change it twice a week, I tell them to give it another week on the patches and then they can stop. But we do try and overlap them so they don't go into a withdrawal um, and get all their menopausal symptoms back again before the pellets can kick in. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then Sherry wanted to know, for women with estrogen pellets, do you balance estrogen with oral progesterone or transdermal progesterone? Uh, we use oral progesterone. The oral progesterone has a better rate getting across the blood-brain barrier than, than the creams. And honestly, a lot of patients who are on creams that come in for the um, for the pellets are sick and tired of putting the creams on every day. So I'm not going to stop them from using the estrogen cream, give them the pellets, and then tell them they have to continue using the progesterone cream. But you get much better blood-brain um, transition with uh, the micronized progesterone. Okay, great. And then Debbie wanted to know, are you able to give hormone pellets without an assistant? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's an extremely simple procedure. Um, you know, I as a gynecologist, I don't go into any room unless it's a man. But I don't go. I've never gone into a room with a patient alone, and that's just you know how I was brought up, and and uh, it's a lot safer that way, especially with crazy people in the world. But <clears throat> you don't need an assistant. I mean, you have a tray in front of you, and everything you need is right there. Um, and it's, uh, it's not a major operation by any means. Okay, great. Um, and then Kylie wanted to know, um, I guess uh, they were referring to the WHI research that it was refuted. Do you have other examples of research that contradicts WHI? You know, we have some, um, there are some articles uh, about the safety of using the pellets. I can't give you any references offhand about are refuting the WHI, but I think over the years in many of the, the journals, the Green Journal, the Gray Journal, and even some of the throwaway journals, there have been articles that have um, talked about the population that they studied being over 60, and many of them already have underlying diseases. Um, so I, I don't think that there's um, disputing the fact that the study was flawed. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then Pamela wanted to know, uh, many of the women, I guess, that she sees on pellets have astronomical testosterone levels, sometimes over 1,300. Can you speak to this, and how is this controlled? Well, <clears throat> it, it's, it, it starts with the person who's uh, giving the dose. Um, they have no clue how much they're giving. Um, if they were using the Sotopelli BioCalc formula, They'd never get a woman up to 1,300. I mean, I've never seen, you know, I consider 350, 375 as being too high for my patients. And those are the ones that are sensitive to the doses that I'm giving them. Uh, sometimes they love it because it really gives them a, a jolt and uh, they're not having any androgen side effects. But I tell them if we kept them at that level, they'd probably start seeing oily skin and acne and maybe some hair growth. But for any woman that has a 1,300 testosterone, it's it's that's the problem of the person who's who's um, who's giving it to her. Okay, that's great. Um, and then Cecil wanted to know how about women who are on synthetics and want pellets. I'm say that again. How how? Um, do... They said, how about women who are on synthetics right. and want pellets? Well, I mean, it's the same thing. If they're on uh, if they're on Premarin, um, you just you can actually plug in how much Premarin they're on to the BioCalc formula, and it will give an equivalent in the pellets. And then you just keep them on that synthetic for a short period of time, maybe another week or half a week, 
and then stop them all together. Okay, great. Um, and then Paul wrote in, he said, how do you treat young males who want children? Um, I use cloning. <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful with young men, you know, who are bodybuilders, who, um, you know, or legitimately have low testosterone levels. Because what you're going to do is shut down their, their, tes their testes and they're going to stop producing any sperm. So <clears throat> what I've done in the past, with men who come in that have low testosterone levels is we'll give them um, clomiphene citrate to try and stimulate uh, the production of testosterone. Okay, that's great. Um, and then Teresa wrote in, she said, do you recommend DIM or 1,3-C? You know, um, um, I, I'm, I'm a member of A4M, which is the anti-aging um, academy, and uh, in my studies through them, They've recommended DIM. Um, I think Soda Pelly, uh has products of DIM. I personally have not used it. Um, I, I find that the pellets do a great job for all these all the symptoms, and um, it's not something that I'm familiar with. Okay. Um, and then Sherry wanted to know what if a patient found that they had reproductive uh, organ cancer right after a pellet insertion, what would be your plan to manage this? Well, it, it, would, it wouldn't be any different than if they didn't have the pellets. Um, and I've had, it's interesting because I've had patients who were diagnosed with breast cancer um, shortly after they had the pellets put in. And um, first I reassured them that the pellets didn't cause their breast cancer. If anything, it might have sped up the diagnosing of it and, and the, the staging of it was much better and they were probably more curable. Um, I've gotten calls from oncologists and from oncologic surgeons about, you know, how do we get these out? <clears throat> and I asked them, is the first thing you do when you diagnose breast cancer is tell a patient they need their ovaries taken out? They said no. I said so. What's what's the problem? I said just treat your disease. These pellets will go away, and they're not going to make your environment any harder to treat or make the situation any worse. Okay, great. These are these are physiologic levels of hormones that we're putting in, um, and you know it, it's like I said, it's not going to change the environment if a cancer is diagnosed. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've had several people write in um, with questions about how you calculate the dose and what formula do you use, um, and also about uh, what Soto Pele actually does, the training, the cost. Could you talk a little bit maybe about that? I know you mentioned um, the, the program that tr uh, Soto runs, uh, but maybe you could touch upon that a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... I'm a, I'm a trainer for them, for Sotopelli. <clears throat> Sotopelli is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a training organization. They don't make the pellets. Um, the pellets are made at compound pharmacies. So um, the formula is, is a formula that when you become a Sotopelli physician or a Sotopelli provider, um, <clears throat> part of the organization that you become part of is getting the, the rights to use the BioCalc, it's called. And it's a calculator that uh, online you, go, you sign in with your sign-in and your password into the, it's called mysotopelli.com, uh, and it brings up, it's a, it's a specific web page that was built, and it has... Uh, it's only it's it has an electronic medical record specifically for your pellet patients. It has the biocap formula. It has uh, the ability for you to uh, write questions into the medical director. <clears throat> um, as far as you know, things you're experiencing with your patients until you feel comfortable that you've seen it before and now you know how to handle it. Um, so that's where the formula is. It's it's proprietary. Um, there's no other company that uses that formula. Um, so, you know, if other people around are using pellets, they are eyeballing it 
and they're they're just flying by the seat of their pants, trying to figure out how much the patients need, and then they are chasing lab results because they'll give some hormones, they'll do a lab test. Uh, if it's real high, they'll test them again weeks later to see where it's going. Um, there's very little guesswork with the formula. As far as the, the training is concerned, um, I, would, I would defer that. Um, Britt, you have information that you can disseminate about um, getting in touch with Sotopelli for Absolutely. all that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow I'm going to be sending the recording along with the webinar slides to everyone that attended here tonight. Um, and then I'll also include information as well as a link to SOTO's website. That way you can get more information on um, what they offer as well as training. The other thing they do is they have, uh, uh, for the patients, when they sign on to SOTOPelliTherapy.com, um, there's a map of the United States. And as part of being a Sotopelli provider, you are put on that map. So if someone is looking for a Sotopelli provider in your area, they just hover over it and bingo, you pop up. So they, they do marketing for us too. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for touching upon that. We, we had definitely had a lot of questions about that. Um, Christine just wrote in and she said, why is an EBV panel done as part of a hormone panel? You know, that, that's, that's a good question. I think it, what we usually do is, um, we don't routinely do any viral studies, but if someone, and, and that's, what's, that's what's fantastic about this treatment be, or this approach, because I've had patients where they've called in and they say, I don't feel any different. I got my pellets and I don't feel any different. I'm still really, really tired. I go, fine, let's look at your labs. Well, you know, for a woman, their testosterone levels 180, 200. For a man, his testosterone levels 1300, 1500. That's when I would do an EB study, EB panel, EBV panel, um, because yes, there are other things that are going to cause those symptoms. That's why we study the thyroid too. I can't tell you how many hypothyroid patients I've picked up who have hadn't had thyroid studies ever or in a while. Um, you know, so. Now I'm treating both their, their, their sex hormones and I'm treating their thyroid hormone. They're feeling better, but I can't tell them what percentage of which problem was causing how they felt, but it's gone. They're feeling better. Okay, great. Um, Laura wrote in and she said, have you ever tested estrogen metabolites on a pellet patient? No, I haven't. Okay, that was an easy answer. <laughs> um, let's see. Beth wrote in and said, is it possible to add estriol to estradiol? Um, as I talk about in, in my lecture when I do the didactic, estriol is a myth hormone. It's, it um, really doesn't do anything. Um, I mean, uh, estriol is, is what we remember from obstetrics when the woman is pregnant. Um, they sell the bias, which you know has the combination of estradiol and estriol, but there's really no. It's a very, very rapidly metabolized estrogen, and it really doesn't have any positive effects. Okay. Um, and then Sherry wrote in, and it looks like she has, um, or maybe she has a question about a, a, a male in his late 40s with low testosterone. Um, and she said, will replace T suppress fertility if they still want to keep fertile? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I think yeah, we mentioned that. Somebody had asked that question a little bit. Um, a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, it, it does. It shuts the. It, it it will shut down the ovarian any functioning ovarian tissue. And if you keep them on long enough, they'll get some um, some actual testicular um, atrophy. Okay. And then um, this is the the last question um, from Bruce. Can pellets be used in patients with previous DVT slash PE? Another great question, and yes, I do have patients who are actually on um, uh, Xarelto, uh, they're on Coumadin. Um, the, great, the, 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 the really positive thing about this treatment is it, by the time it gets to the liver, it's diluted out, there is no increase in clotting factors, um, 
And, you know, the only concern I had when I started using it was that they're going to bleed when I put it in. And I have not had any bleeding problems with it. So, yes, I do have patients who are actively on anticoagulants for previous DVTs, PEs, um, and they're back getting their hormones. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. Sakine. We really appreciate it. Um, if, if people have additional questions, um, I will have information in the email tomorrow where you can send those additional questions for Dr. Sakine. Um, but thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate it. And hopefully you will join us for our next upcoming seminars. Um, our next one will be in May, and then we have a, another one in June. So please stay tuned for that. Um, again, please visit uh, powertopractice.com for more information. And um, thank you again, and hope you have a great evening.